Hi everyone, so, um, thank you very much for joining us. So we're very excited to um, uh, bring to you um, Graham, uh, Professor Graham Hughes again uh, uh, for a live Q&A uh, for the benefit of uh, GHIC, the global, uh, for the, um, the Graham Hughes International Charity. Uh, and uh, we, um, yeah, well, we're, we're thrilled to have the man himself and uh, he, he hardly needs any introduction, but obviously he, um, uh, discovered uh, um, the, the syndrome, uh, uh, then called uh, APS, and uh, and then uh, given the honorary name of the Graham Hughes syndrome uh, uh, at, a, at a large symposium, uh, which shows you the regard in which he he is held. Um, uh, he founded uh, uh, the um, uh, GHIC uh, really to push to provide more information to provide. Uh, um, uh, uh, to provide for more information for people and for clinicians and to further the understanding of the disease uh, to look to to fund research and um, uh, and provide support and uh, so one of the things that obviously uh, in the straight in time so any donations are very much welcomed uh, and could be done on the website um, all right without uh, uh, further ado I'm going to um, introduce Graham and say hello hello Graham yeah. Uh, wonderful to to be joining you. And now, now last time we were socially distanced in in our office. Now this time we're socially distanced with seventy five miles between us. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're done. Like east, easterly part of Britain, eh? the, the facing Calais. Yeah, no. That's well, it's wonderful to to yeah to be able to join you and uh, uh, and wonderful to have you here. Um, so well, without further ado, let's, uh, let's, so we've had a lot of questions sent in. As you know, there's a lot of interest and excitement whenever you come on uh, from a global audience. Uh, and uh, um, I look forward to, uh, uh, yeah, in, if anyone has any further questions, do comment them either in the Facebook thread or in the, in the Twitter thread. And we will try to get to them. Uh, we've had a lot of questions sent in before, which we're going to, um, which we're going to start with. We've split them uh, into uh, sort of four main groups, medication, uh, living with APS, uh, symptoms and, and other, you know, one, one other, uh, and we'll try and uh, intercede any questions people upload uh, as we go along. So the first question from Sam uh, on Facebook uh, was, uh, are there any alternatives to uh, um, warfarin for APS patients? Uh, yes, is the answer. Um, thank you for the question, which is always being asked. But uh, the treatment at the moment basically is anticoagulation, stopping clotting. And there are three drugs being used around for donkey's ears, which are aspirin, heparin, and warfarin. Um, and for mild cases, aspirin is the main, baby aspirin is the main drug. Heparin, well, come back to that because it's more quick acting and so on, but it is an injection, so therefore it's not popular. Um, and warfarin, which is hated by the media, but is an extremely useful drug, and especially if it's monitored by patients as well as their clinics. Um, there are all the time new drugs being tried, old drugs such as hydroxychloroquine, which has been touted for, for the COVID virus, um, steroids, but not very successfully, and immunosuppressives, because they've been used in other, what we call autoimmune disease. And I can come back to those individually. For most people at the moment, we're still limited with the three drugs that we know and, and trust. You, you mentioned a, a link with a drug um, uh, being used for COVID. Can I ask a bit more about that? Uh, yes, uh, the, the drug which is called chloroquine or its derivative of chloroquine called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil uh, has been claimed, but I gather that the results haven't borne out the great hope that was there. But it is a used drug, it's well used in a disease called lupus, which is a, like a cousin of Hughes syndrome, if you like, an autoimmune disease, very useful for the fatigue and aches and pains. Um, the other drug that's been used and claimed to be useful is, of course, steroids. But you'd expect that because high-dose steroids are amazingly strong when it comes to inflammation. Uh, so for a short period of time, the intensive care doctors have been using that. The third one is quite interesting. It's that many people with COVID get thrombosis. And there have been suggestions that it's like the Hughes syndrome in some ways. 
And in fact, talking to my colleagues um, at London Bridge, they, they certainly use anticoagulants for the very acute sick patients on, on the COVID ward. Uh, but that's a temporary, not a long-term treatment. Yes, I just realised the, the chloroquine is the uh, the one that Trump was uh, um, talking he about. Was. He was. And I don't know if it pushed up the sales or not in the States, but uh, it, it, it was tried early on, but, but has not proved the great success, I, I understand. And do we know anything about um, people with Graham Hughes syndrome and getting COVID? Do they have... Um, do they have more issues, less issues? Do we do we have any information? Um, luckily, there's very little negative data that, that, that we don't know that there's been a specific risk. The same applies for other autoimmune diseases like lupus. Our lupus unit and our colleagues who work in the NHS in lupus centres in London, Southampton, and so on, don't feel that patients with autoimmune disease have a bigger risk uh, from COVID than those without, which is reassuring. It is, and it's very, it's very important. I think we all remain very worried, particularly as we're seeing numbers start to tick up again, yes, and numbers yes. ticking up in uh, the, the the previous tick up has been in the younger age group, and now we're seeing it tick up in the wider population. So, yes, yes, um, it is. And as we as we speak today, there's just been a new rule, uh, um, with uh, only six people can can be together. So that we've we've had a tightening of rules today. Yes, yes, it's very depressing, isn't it, actually? Everyone thought we were coming out of the tunnel, but we'll see. And has it, has, um, um, how's, how have you uh, treating um, the COVID risk? How have you changed what you're doing? Um, well, my wife is under the care of the asthmatic clinic and uh, she's at high risk from the lungs. Um, and we've been self-isolating. We're lucky in that we have family and friends and so on down here in in the village near the coast where I am and um, I, I, we, we, we don't have the sort of one flat and three kids scenario which must be awful for, for those people on you know on the Covid so we, we've been uh, what's the word protecting or s s protecting our family from any contacts and obeying all the rules um, but, but it has meant a break in my normal practice yeah and I think, um, and and uh, are you now kind of like you so coming to London? You 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 had started coming up to London again. Do you think you'll yeah. still do that, or do you think that we're reviewing how things are going right now? We we'll review. I think we just don't know. Um, we listen to the radio, you know, the radio, the telly every evening for the latest figures, yeah. but it's undoubtedly been an increase, and um, not just people who've been to nightclubs and things, but more general increase. I think. Um, Yes, I think that's what, what, what we're, we're, we're seeing as well. Now, the reason I, I thought it'd be interesting for people to hear that is to, to know that, you know, that you and everyone really are changing what they're doing and and how, you know, that they're not alone in, in doing that and and sort of communicate to the sort of wider population how how we're all being careful. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Let's, uh, and uh, um, Carolyn on Facebook, thank you for your question. We will get to it. Um, I just want to uh, acknowledge it and, and let you know, know we've got it. Um, right, Di on Facebook sent in a, a question before, and you touched on actually um, uh, blood clots and thrombosis uh, around COVID. She wanted to know, do people with diagnosed APS on warfarin have more risk of clots um, with COVID than people without APS? And so you yeah. touched on that people are treating um, and that COVID is how uh, people are having thrombosis. I suppose she wants to know if, if them, she's more at risk. Um, theoretically, you might be less at risk because you're on anticoagulants. It's stopping the, the sticky blood situation. Uh, as far as I know at the moment, there is no increase uh, or, for that matter, decrease risk of COVID in patients who are antiphospholipid positive. Um, but, you know, if my feeling in a practical term is that if you have this, that you are anyway at double risk if you get lung clot and then COVID affecting the lungs. So in that respect, I think you have a, a potential illness that you could cover by being uh, even more um, safe about distancing and all the rest of it. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. I, I think that's the, the conundrum, isn't it? That you've got an increased risk because you've potentially, and we don't, we don't know, know right now, um, 
but um, there's obviously a concern of the, having the two at the same time. Um, but at yeah. the same time, you're already on one of the treatments that, that that's supposed to help. And if you're on the steroids, you might be on two. And, and that then might balance things out. But overall, we still don't know. It's a new disease. And then this is a new disease interacting with uh, another disease. And uh, right now, the data, we, we just don't have enough. And playing safe clearly is the, the right thing to do. Does that, that summary work about right? It does. Very much so. Great. Because um, so obviously, it's something people are understandably very, very worried about. Um, Ali, also on Facebook, I am on, uh, uh, um, you're going to need to correct me on this one. I'm on a Fonda Paranux. Fonda Paranux? Yes, yes. Um, and have been on blood thinners since 2006 when diagnosed um, by a doctor, now a professor, in the lupus unit at Tommy's and Guys. Uh, and a side note to uh, everyone watching, uh, um, you know, listing all Graham's achievements is very, it takes too long. Um, and uh, uh, obviously we know we know how much he's done, but one of the things he did was actually, he's the founder of also the uh, Lupus Clinic at St. Thomas's, uh, which was the second Lupus Clinic he founded after founding the first one in the country uh, and in Europe, was it? Was it in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, so he founded this clinic. Um, recently, I've been told uh, I may have to come off all blood thinners, uh, not even being, get, being, being given anything, even um, clopidogrel. Uh, I've gone from warfarin to clex, clexane. Yes. Ali, like this is this is a very difficult question in terms of uh, enunciation. <laughs> um, um, I've been given anything in. in have I said this right? Claude, Claude Pridor, Pr Claude. Claude Pridor. Oh, one of my patients calls it cloppy dog roll. Okay, I've been with cloppy dog roll. Uh, and uh, um, I've gone to warfarin to collexane, uh, fraud to prinux, uh, to nothing. Is this a new protocol, please? No, it's, it's not a new protocol. It's something that's tried. Obviously, there are, there are patients who were very ill to start with, with severe clots, and they usually end up going quickly through the the list until they reach warfarin and many stay on that for the fullness of time but the difficulty for us is that in some patients the tests for sticky blood do become negative the patient remains well can i please come off this dreadful warfarin because it stops me taking you know fruit and eating different foods and things um what we do then is retest if the tests remain negative it's a slightly unknown quantity for us and for the patients but we would tail down as slowly as we conveniently can the medicine. And ultimately we have quite a few patients who are off everything. I think it's just risking things too much to stop if for instance warfarin bang like that. And, and that applies to most drugs, I think. If that doesn't answer the question, come back to me on it, please, because you're asking a very difficult question. The patient who's doing well on a drug which is very difficult to handle for some patients uh, and you walk a very fine balancing act between reducing and stopping the drug. Now Fondaparinux and other things, clopidogrel, are alternatives. Clopidogrel is, I call it, expensive aspirin. Very similar, it affects platelets, makes them less sticky. It's a very useful drug if a patient has not tolerated aspirin or is in some way against using it. So that's one of the reasons that drug is in our basket of drugs. Uh, the next one up is heparin, which is a brilliant medicine. It stops clotting, but the major disadvantage is it's an injection. And we use that as a holding drug in many patients before deciding whether to want a more complicated drug such as warfarin uh, or, or even one of the newer ones, which I'm sure you'll be asking about in a minute. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Let's see on, as, as the questions come. You, you said like the reasons for coming off the, the drug so, um, is that someone might now be negative uh, for, um, for the yes. syndrome. Are there other yeah. reasons people would be coming off? Um, small numbers, I think, is the correct answer at the moment. Uh, in a, of course, we are a hospital clinic, so we, by definition, see the most complicated cases. Patients with more mild disease, many of them, uh, are on aspirin alone, and of course, some patients refuse everything. Um, 
as far as warfarin is concerned, it's a very useful drug. I keep telling patients it's the one drug that the patient can control herself, control the dosage of, which gives it a huge advantage over many of the newer oral anticoagulants, for instance. The trouble is it's, it's a pain in the neck because the dose is different for every individual. Some patients only need a tiny dose, three milligrams, others it's 12. And many of our patients buy their own self-testing thing for stickiness of the blood, the finger prick test. And many of our patients swear by that, even though they're still under the anticoagulant clinics. And I believe in it. I think it's if you start getting headaches or symptoms of Hughes syndrome, again, you check your blood stickiness with this machine. <clears throat> Uh, and um, actually, we're going to bring in a question that's been posted uh, uh, online. So um, Wendy, uh, who says, good morning from South Africa. Um, so anyway. wonderful to ha ha have her, her join us and from so far. Um, my mum has been on uh, warfarin uh, for her APS for around two years now, uh, and her INR has never been stable. It ranges between one, uh, uh, eight, and its worst ever was over nine. Uh, why does she still clot at an INR of between three and three and a half? What should the INR be in an APS patient? And, and how do you recommend it be stabilised? It's a, a very important question. It's common. Warfarin is affected by, as you probably know, everything. I mean, if you drink alcohol at the weekend, your INR goes funny. If you um, take certain fruits, certain berries, it affects it, green foods. Some patients diet just to keep the INR more stable, but uh, I think that's almost impractical. So what do you do? Um, I am a strong believer in getting your anticoagulant clinic to blend you or to buy yourself an anticoagulant clinic. You mentioned INR. INR is the finger prick test for stickiness of the blood. It should be one. Uh, if, if your blood is thin, it comes up to three, five, seven, as you say. For patients in the ordinary anticoagulant clinic, the ratio is about two. But this is usually for little old ladies with atrial fibrillation. It's not for patients with the Hughes syndrome who are more at risk. Uh, most of my patients who've had a major clot need an INR up around three. In some cases, 3.5 or even four. Now, your anticoagulant nurse may throw his or her hands up in horror at that because over four, the risk of a bleed increases. But it does give you the, the individual way of monitoring your INR and very, very gently nudging the dose up and down. And I think for a patient sticking with their anticoagulant clinic, of course, this is one way forward. Whenever I see a patient, especially with a history like this, I ask if I can see their, um, their little booklet in this country. And South Africa, I don't know if it's the same, but you get a little book with your INR recorded. And what you see, the patient's still getting symptoms, INR 2, 2.5, 2.7, 2.3. Patient's not being treated. It's like, it's like giving too little digoxin for a heart condition. You've got to get the dose right. And the patient knows that dose normally if they keep their eye. eye. And I will need to bet that her INR has fluctuated wildly. Um, the, there are alternatives. If it is truly a total failure, then there are new anticoagulants and uh, there's great interest in them. Uh, but the evidence is not yet strong that they're effective. And there are slightly worrying case reports of people who've flared in one way or another on one of the new oral anticoagulants. So slightly watch this space. Our teenagers don't like being on warfarin because it affects your social life. Um, some of them are advocating the new anticoagulants, but we're in the middle of looking and there's a number of trials going on to see uh, how, how they come out. Oh, great. And um, actually we've had um, uh, a question come in uh, um, as you've just started talking about other uh, other drugs, we've had two come in on uh, Facebook. Um, Christelle asking if non-K uh, anticoagulants are, are as effective as uh, warfarin. Uh, and uh, Anna uh, in um, uh, from Barcelona, so hello Anna. Uh, um, she's on uh, uh, aconocumaral uh, instead of warfarin. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and is that okay? 
as she's been on it for 11 years since being diagnosed with APS after a double embolism. Mm. Um, the answer to that is it depends on the individual. We did a lot of our research work with the group in Barcelona actually and they are really outstanding in their, in their contribution to this, um, the history of this disease. Um, yeah, it's one of the things that is tried and it, what applies is what I said in the last answer that if it works for the patient, that's great. And we have a number of patients on it, very happy. But the overall data has been worrying that there have been some new clots in patients who swap from warfarin to acicumarol. But uh, if you're well, if you're symptomatic, you're not getting headaches and so on, uh, probably stick with that. And what, um, and uh, is acicumarol, is that a non-K anticoagulant? What, I don't know what a non-K anticoagulant is. Well, they the affect vitamin K, the old ones, and um, vitamin K is part of the clotting. Don't ask me about clotting, I don't understand it. It's, um, it's so complicated. Um, every time you go to a lecture on clotting, you, your eyes close and, and you sit sideways. Um, it's complicated because there are dozens of 15 steps in clotting. The good news is that the boffins who deal with studies of clotting can isolate the various steps and hopefully provide an anecdote to each step. And, and, and are the, um, are the uh, non-K anticoagulants as effective as warfarin or what's your view of that or is it more about, is it more an individual? How, how... Well the original studies show that they are as effective. Uh, there have been studies in China actually all places for um, people with uh, heart clotting troubles who've they found that the new ones have been as good in trials. There's only one big trial so far that I know of that's been comparing these newer drugs with warfarin and that's a combined study with uh, Price and Thomas's and UCH in, in London and sadly that's been published showing it's not there's not as great an overall effect in terms of side effect, lack of side effects uh, and or stopping re-thrombosis risk. Great. Well, we're going to go to one of the um, uh, back to some of the questions that were sent in before. So can um, from Irene, uh, can metformin uh, cause a flare? Uh, it gave me a rash and other um, lupusy syndromes, symptoms. Um, I don't know that metformin, usually diabetes, um, interferes. I don't know that, I am afraid. Um, however, if on starting that drug, he developed a rash, that almost certainly is an allergic reaction and uh, you should try off the drug and see the dermatologist. Um, every drug can cause a rash. He, even our old friend Plaquenil it rarely can cause a rash. And we had a question from, um, uh, which I, I do want to re refer, you said like you don't understand blood clotting. I think that was you being extremely modest and uh, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, to avoid it so far. Um, uh, um, Sam asked, um, must I be off, uh, um, come off anticoagulants to get accurate results for a blood screen? Uh, can you repeat that, uh, yeah, Henry? Um, Sam asked, uh, do I need to come off anticoagulants uh, to get accurate results from a, from a blood screen? Yeah. Uh, no, you don't. Um, the only thing it does affect, of course, is the clotting mechanism. Uh, so in general, it does not affect your routine blood screen. Right, we're going to go now. Our second set of questions was living with APS. And, uh, and we are trying to get to as many questions that are being posted uh, as, we, as, as we speak as well. And so I'll try and um, blend those in. Um, uh, well, kicking off with a pretty, um, pretty uh, hard one uh, on, on living with APS. So Tracy uh, messaged in and she said, what proportion of people diagnosed with APS live with a permanent impairment in their lives? Um, I don't know the figure I'm guessing, but I would say uh, five to 10% uh, had, had a major clot. And of course, the, the most major ones, almost certainly the neurologic things. I mean, I always teach that the two organs that are most sensitive to sticky blood are the brain 
and when you're pregnant, the placenta, hence the recurrent miscarriage story. So if the, the, the worst feature of APS, of course, would be a stroke. And there's one study which is really alarming, in, and it came from Rome in Italy, that um, one in five young strokes, one in five, under the age of 45, the stroke is associated with uh, Hughes syndrome and antiphospholipid antibodies. So here with the government looking at causes of stroke and a lot of uh, money being spent on diagnosis and protecting it. So here's a very, very um, important cause of stroke, if you like, in untreated patients. Right. And actually, uh, you, you referenced pregnancy just then. And um, we've had yes. a question come in um, from Jem on Facebook. Uh, where she asked, how early on would you recommend taking baby aspirin and heparin, please? I've been told by some people to start straight away uh, or even when trying to conceive, but others don't start until seven to 12 weeks. Um, immense um, discrepancies here in the way doctors look at this. Um, it's the ABS is the commonest treatable cause, the commonest treatable cause of recurrent miscarriages. The problem is um, that when you look at the medical economics of it, testing all pregnancies apparently is prohibitive in terms of uh, cost, etc. Now, I, I think strongly we can do better than that, better than waiting for three miscarriages, which is the current sort of talk. Um, I think if the midwife or the doctor attending the patient on her first visit asks three simple questions, three questions, um, have you had a clot? Are you a migraine sufferer? Or do you have a family history of what we call autoimmune diseases, by which I mean MS, uh, thyroid disease, lupus? Then you should be tested. And I'm sure, I'm sure that that would limit the numbers who need the test. Now, if the test is positive, um, then of course the evidence suggests aspirin. Certainly in my family, it would be the rule. I mean, there's so little side effect in baby aspirin alone. And it's certainly been shown to be effective. But others have suggested that in their studies, aspirin alone is not good enough in a patient who has got the diagnosis. And the, the present, for those who've had a clot or have had recurrent miscarriages, there has been a move towards the combination of aspirin and heparin. And that certainly has seemed to have improved the outcome. What about not being able to conceive? Yes, that is a definite feature of my syndrome. And we often have patients getting married, trying for pregnancy, nothing happened for two years, three years. Uh, and then for one reason or another, they've gone on aspirin. Now we don't know yet whether aspirin is the cause of the success in those patients or whether it's a fluke. Um, but the figures are improving year on year, and it really has been had a major impact in the world of, of pregnancy. Very yeah. gone quiet, Henry. Um, I can't hear. Um, and. Uh... I think you could hear me just then. We're back. Um, uh, so I think one of the things you've just you've just said is, uh, um, yeah, that in general you see a positive outcome from from treatment health, assistance in conception and, and and then pregnancy. So your your general advice would be would be to say earlier, uh, but obviously and uh, the caveat is that this is a live Q and A, not an individual. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. Diagnosis, and you must talk to your your your, your doctor, uh, and that was obviously also particularly for people with uh, with the syndrome. Uh, and so, obviously, people watching, you can see that we're we're fluidly um, bringing in your questions as as we can. Um, going back to one that was sent before, so Irene, um, uh, doctors tell me that I don't have APS. I've had, uh, uh, but I've had TIAs and been told that I have a brain aneurysm. Um, how can I take doc can I get doctors to take APS seriously when I don't test positive on bloods but only on symptoms? That, that's a problem in most aspects of medicine where the patient has many of the symptoms, 
that the tests are negative. And that's certainly very much something we see. Now, if you're sure clinically that this is the direction the patient's going in, then I, I would be treating her as a case of antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, there are three reasons that that might be the case. One is that the tests were positive and they're now negative. We see that. The other is that um, we've got the wrong diagnosis, and I'll come back to that. Um, and, and the third one is trial and error is never the best thing. Having said that, uh, we've seen a number of, a large number we've published on this, of patients, what we call seronegative APS, who have improved dramatically once treatment has been started. Now, the problem with this lady's question is, I think I'm right in saying she has an aneurysm. And that opens a whole differential diagnosis. So there's a questionnaire you can ask. I mean, I, I've written one for our, for our charity, but there are 40 or so symptoms and signs that you can add up and get you know, percentages that are indicative. And that's sort of a bit like self-diagnosis, but I, I think it's what the doctors do and what many patients can do. And having mentioned it, I'll, I'll send uh, the team this list and some may argue with it but it includes very commonly things like migraine um, balance problems sometimes low platelets bruising uh, um, movement disorders shaky hand they're all neurological things and even seizures or a, an odd epilepsy type thing they're all features we see but are not you know put together by uh, the doctor she's seeing as, as one diagnosis now, can you so you can you have you can have Graham Hughes syndrome and test negative on the blood uh, um, test? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, we don't know the percentage. Um, by definition, we don't know. But a number of people like Laura Bertolaccini in our unit is looking at newer tests. So the third reason for negative tests is we're not clever enough yet that, that there are tests now available come up positive where the others are negative. They're available in research centers, but they're not out there yet. So at the moment, we're still sticking with the three blood. When you give a blood sample, the three tests are done it, APL, or apple test as I call it, uh, lupus anticoagulant, which is a fussy test. Um, and those are the two most widely used, or another one for 10 years now, the beta two test. But as far as the doctors ticking the box is concerned, one tick, and that's uh, tests for APO, antiphospholipid antibodies. Great, I, yeah, I think that's very interesting and um, obviously shows the complexity of, of, of the disease and, and also just the complexity of medicine. That the, I, I, think, yeah. I think when you're a patient, you always rather hope that uh, there's, always, it's an, there's an exact answer, that it's always very clear. And unfortunately, that's not, not, not the reality. I, I should say that if, if her family or she puts herself through this questionnaire, she'll get good way, halfway up, not more, towards a diagnosis. Can I tell you about one patient I had? Of course. She, she uh, had all the features of Hughes syndrome. She was falling about. She had headaches. Her, her memory was gone. She couldn't remember family names and so on. And she was diagnosed, her tests were positive. She was treated ultimate heparin first, then warfarin. She's perfectly normal now, working in a shop. I see her once a year. Um, and then it turned out she has an identical twin. And stupidly, we didn't realize this. Her mother has lupus and hence the referral to me. And so we looked at the identical twin, falling about, headaches, um, all the features, but the tests were negative. Would you treat? Uh, the answer is yes, very definitely. So we treated with aspirin first, then heparin, and then she's now on warfarin, completely free of symptoms. And she also works in a shop 200 miles away. So seronegative, seropositive, but identical disease. Um, so it shows where we are at with some patients. But... That's, that's extraordinary. I hadn't heard that story before with a, a a twin, one being positive, one being negative, but they both um, clearly showed the symptoms of, of having having the symptom, the syndrome. Um, yeah, that's extraordinary. Um, Jean from Facebook, uh, um, uh, perhaps a simpler question. Is blood type connected to APS? No, it's not. You mean ABO, 
Uh, there's no, as far as I know, there's no correlation. We looked at this many years ago and didn't find one. Short answer. Um, uh, from Marion, um, what is the recommended INR for positive APS with a history of DVT uh, times three? Um, just, I mean, it is very artificial because I haven't seen the patient, but three, three to 3.5 would be. I think the rare patients who are getting new mini strokes on warfarin, that's when you go higher, um, 3.5 to 4. Um, now, the statistics show that the risk of bleeding is not as high as you think. I mean, it's only over four where the, the linear risk rises, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean by linear risk? What do... Well, if, if your INR is two, you may get mar marked improvement, but still get you know, headaches, for instance. If you go up to 2.5, you may get an improvement in the headaches. But if you don't, you're starting to get mini strokes or, or whatever, we often go pushing it very gently up towards four. The, st the figures going back 100 years or whatever heparin's been around for show that it's over four, that um, you know, the risk of bleeding is higher. And, um, uh, Jean from uh, uh, posted a question for us. Um, I'm diagnosed as APS anti-beta-2 glycoprotein, IgM, and weak LA, and anti-thrombolin-3. Did that, like, I think I think for our viewers, I think we, people would be interested yeah. to know what those, all of those things it, mean. It's getting to what we were saying in the last question, actually. There are three current tests. I mean, until about 10 years ago, there were two tests. There's dreaded LA, which is not a good test, then the anti anticardiolipin, which I think is the best test. Uh, um, and that was it. And then a group in, uh, well, three groups actually, one in Italy, um, one in Australia, found that there was a protein called beta-2 involved in clotting, and the antibodies to beta-2 were a risk factor for thrombosis. So most labs now do the three tests, but next year you may find it's four or even five tests of one sample of blood. So your patients will just question me that that for me would be strong evidence of, of a clotting disorder. Okay. Um, and I think they're asking um, uh, what causes there to be sort of different results with the different tests? Um, all biological tests, and this is one which, is, for instance, counting platelets, um, are variable uh, for technical reasons as well as daily life reasons. There is the 24-hour clock, uh, which has effects on drugs and on symptoms and so on, and on some tests. Some tests are very stable. They, they put some people in the North Pole 20 years ago, uh, and the, half of them were on a 13-hour clock, and half of them were on a 12-hour clock. I may be slightly wrong there, but that's what they did. And all the tests of the body, except one, were uh, altered were unstable and the one was potassium remained absolutely the same so obviously our maker you know gave a great importance to potassium uh, whereas not quite so important for all the other tests that might be relevant to your question i know but, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting. Yes, and, and george is just going to a bit of detail about the potassium for people for people watching Potassium is one of the things, in, one of the chemicals in your blood, the electrolytes, and it's important to keep it stable. It affects muscle function, it affects heart function, and so on. Uh, but it, it's important to measure it if a patient has any kidney problems. Um, Jean went on to say that she didn't want her, her children to uh, uh, have the syndrome. Um, and, and asked if there's anything that can be done to prevent that. Yes, there is. Um, go back to the family history. Is it strong? You know, is it just one relative maybe with a mild symptom? Or is, you know, you have an aunt with lupus, a mother with uh, thyroid disease? And if there's a strong family history, you should push to check your child. Now, first of all, it's commoner in women than men. Uh, I think five times more common in females than males. Recently, that was because they were picked up from pregnancy problems, but it may be a true difference. In my patients, it's 
uncommon to start before the period starts. And if your daughter starts getting symptoms when the periods start, which are which are not normal, which are you know more than just menopausal problems or men, sorry, starting period problems, then I would push because we've seen a number of cases where the illness has started in the teens. And the classic is a young girl who gets glandular fever type of illness, remains unwell, misses a whole term, sometimes misses the whole year of illness. And that's often the history we get prior to any autoimmune disease, including MS, thyroid, and Hughes syndrome. And so I think to answer Jean's question, in, in terms of there's nothing that can be done to prevent it, um, um, but what you can do is intervene, because I think she talked about uh, um, some family um, uh, relatives who, who have been very affected Did and have had a, a stroke while, 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 while young. Uh, and um, so I think what you're saying is, if there is a strong family history, then test, particularly around uh, the, the, the teen years and around when menopause is, is starting, uh, with a note Men though that you can... Period. Well, sorry, one period. Yes, I, I did the same mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. um, we'll get through this together. Um, the, um, the uh, um, but but to note that you could be negative before and, and after, and so you need to do multi, multi, you know test a few times yes. uh, and yes. and really test just to to check and make sure so that you can be preemptively treating to avoid a a a, a, a very significant. Yeah, uh, what I would do in my family if, if I came across that. I really would. Um, we're going on to symptoms now. Um, uh, Rosie um, from Facebook asked, um, does uh, APLA affect your eyesight? Yes, yes. APA, APL can affect eyesight. That can be one of the symptoms. Uh, usually it's from the brain that, that there's a feeling of partial loss of vision in one eye. Very occasionally it's more dramatic and there's a clot in the eye with sudden loss of vision. Luckily that's rare, but it's, and sadly it's a feature in some patients. Uh, a medical emergency, heparin needed, anti-clotting, and then possibly warfarin later. And what, what happens to the eyes or what, what's the impact? Well, the common symptoms are visual disturbances, seeing funny shapes and so on, or loss of partial field vision, you can't see the right hand side of your um, of your picture uh, or, or dramatically very rare I've only seen a few cases uh, where sudden loss of the vision in one eye uh, is the case think uh, think loss of vision in one eye always think a clot because it's it's not a disease of both eyes um, we then um, uh, our, our second question on symptoms from Mavis um, uh, my daughter was hospitalized with a suspected heart attack. Uh, results were not conclusive. She continues to have angina attacks, swollen joints and lupus symptoms. She injects twice a day to thin the blood. Um, uh, could her systems mean a, a microvascular disease? And is there anything else she should be doing? So how old is she? Um, and go, uh, hmm. It doesn't say. Well, apparently you diagnosed her around 20 years ago, so we'll have to guess from that. Right. Um, this is lovely. You have a lot of patients who come and come and watch and, and ask questions. It, it, it shows the high, uh, another indication of the high regard everyone has for you. Thank you. But, well, there's two parts to this question. One is angina and the heart, and the other is lupus. And angina is definitely a feature. Funnily enough, we concentrated over the last 30 years on the brain much more and on DVTs and on pulmonary emboli. Uh, but we, we actually didn't publish as much on heart disease. Things are changing. Our cardiologists are sending us now young women under 40 with angina. And that's one presentation. And I don't know if any of you have read Keith. Thackeray's book, which I think is the best book on the subject. Kay Thackeray is one of my patients, and she, amongst her many symptoms and the many clinics she had to visit, was a cardiology clinic in Angina, and that improves once you start anticoagulant. Lupus is very important because it's a cousin of Hughes syndrome. It's an autoimmune disease. It's now recognized as common. And it was in our lupus clinic 
uh, at Hammersmith Hospital that we first describe this syndrome in detail. We noticed that amongst our lupus patients, a small number, in fact it turns out to be one in five, have the sticky blood features. And they differ somewhat from lupus, they're not so much aches and pains as lupus, um, more clots obviously in lupus, and the miscarriage problem is not lupus, it's the sticky blood side. So one in five, it keeps coming up one in five, but one in five lupuses have got Hughes syndrome. And some people call it a secondary APS as opposed to primary APS, which occurs in the absence. So most of our patients with Hughes syndrome, four out of five, do not have lupus. And the good news is that they do not seem to go on to get lupus. And I speak from 40 years experience, as you put it there, very rare. Um, so if you have a young, say, teenager with aches and pains, feelings of lupus, other funny symptoms like angina, um, aches and pains are specifically test for lupus every time, anti-DNA, simple test, um, test for sticky blood, of course, and um, they, they have different treatments. If it's lupus or sticky blood, you treat with belt and braces, you treat with quinine, or steroids even for lupus, and with an anticoagulant of some sort for Hughes syndrome. Now, I hope that answers your question. No, I, 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 I'm sure it's very helpful. Now, she specifically mentioned microvascular disease. Uh, yes. What, what is that and uh, what can be done about it? The microvascular, that term has come up a lot in the last decade. And that is instead of getting a big clot in your leg and the leg getting fat or a major clot in your heart and getting a heart attack, in some patients it seems to be a more widespread small vessel disease and microvascular in other words. And if a patient dies and they do an autopsy, you see small clots all over the place. Um, and, and that's important. So it's diagnostically important because the patient can be very confusing history going and, um, you know, heart, brain, muscles, joints, uh, and nothing too much to see. And that's certainly something that modern tests uh, are able to help much more. Scanning techniques are better. And yes, they need treatment as much as the patient with a big clot is concerned. Um, Jumping around there. Um, the, um, uh, we had a question emailed in, and then we're going to, um, we've had a, a few questions um, come in, which have been posted. Uh, for that reason, they, um, for people watching, they won't be quite as well organized, uh, um, but uh, um, we will get to them. Um, and I think this is a, a good point for me to say, like, look, we are charities, the Graham Hughes International Charity, uh, and uh, donations are incredibly important. I, normally, uh, charities would be relying on events uh, and uh, uh, events and those kind of things to raise money, uh, and those aren't available to us. So, if you if you are able to donate, uh, donations are very important and very very uh, very valued. And um, without them, obviously, we, we can't do anything. So, uh, I had to put that that plug plug in, um, but uh, it is absolutely essential. Um, the um, uh, and uh, I'll grab all of this. We'll put some more of those in uh, as we go along, uh, because it is it is absolutely essential. Um, right. So we had a question, and it was uh, um, uh, um, sent in by email. So my my daughter has suffered severe intermittent psychotic episodes, uh, each lasting around five months since the age of fifteen. She was born two months premature and suffered an intraventricular bleed. If she has got Hugh syndrome from me, is there a chance that it's sticky blood that is an intermittent trigger for sudden psychotic relapses? If she is put on some form of anticoagulant, might there be a chance that these repeat psychotic episodes might stop? Um, it's a big question. Yes, yes. the answer is yes. Um, I've got one patient with exactly that history who has responded to anticoagulation. It's a long shot, obviously, there are many causes. Um, I've forgotten whether you said there's a family history or not, but it, no, he, it's important he, he, he to go through he, he all those to... questions, including family history. Um, it, it, the brain is stupid. If it doesn't get enough oxygen, you get headaches or your memory goes or you get seizures. 
there's a, there's a study now to say that one in five teenage epileptics have got this underlying problem of stickiness of the blood. Um, my old answer would have been to say I, I must see the patient um, and go over it with her and her family. Um, the question is, you know, the weighing up the side effects of treatment and the effect of the illness. Now, there's no question that a doctor must not do harm, but here, you know, it's a terrible situation and it's a consideration. I would do all the blood tests, including the newer ones, for this patient for sticky blood. Uh, I would even test the family for, for it, which would give you an added help towards a possible label for your daughter. And then I would consider treatment. Now, there's one treatment which we use a lot uh, in, my, in my clinic. That is the use of heparin. No good giving aspirin alone, I think, here, because it's probably been tried. Heparin is a daily injection. It's used for anyone with a clock because it acts immediately. And I've found from our pregnancy clinic that when a woman who's had miscarriages goes on heparin, her symptoms disappear, her headaches are gone for most of the nine months. And it's a, it's a way of, of looking at the moment, it's the best we've got. Two or three weeks of self-administered heparin, it's a daily injection given by the patient herself. And it may not be long enough, but it often gives you a clear black and white answer. And it's something that we've published on and it's, it's out there. We certainly have experience of it. So you, uh, and so you published on um, psychotic episodes and uh, um, and, and, and Graham Hughes syndrome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think. Well, look, I hope David, that's that's helped, and um, it's clearly very, very, very important. Um, we've gone through now. Those are all our questions that we've had. Um, we've had sent in uh, um, uh, prior, and now we're just going to go through some that have been been done now. Um, uh, right, let's, um, uh, COVID is obviously a, que a, a question here. So we've got Christina from, from Malaga in Spain. Um, and could, uh, um, could COVID be a trigger for, uh, CAPS? Uh, are we at risk? Um, now, CAPS is, it's given, it's for catastrophic APS. And, um, been a number of studies and people in Barcelona actually are the main, um, collectors of all the data on this. They're very rare, very rare patients suddenly change and get clots everywhere. They've been going along nicely for 10 years or whatever. Um, I've only seen three or four in my life. Uh, it's, 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 it's very complicated. Um, occasionally it's caused when a patient suddenly stops an anticoagulant. The other time it's been associated with this big infection has triggered it. So you're very wise to ask whether that can be a, a factor. Now, all I need to do is contact the group in, in uh, Barcelona and say, has this been reported? But to my knowledge, it's not a, a risk factor. I think we would have heard about it. One of my hats is as the editor of the journal Lupus, and I have not seen papers yet suggesting this. No, and, I, and uh, I'm aware from um, the GHIC trustee meetings that obviously this is a discussion, a very significant discussion point, and, and as yet there's been no, I don't think people are aware of a significant difference for um, patients with, with Graham-Hughes syndrome and, and having COVID and, and having different, different outcomes, but obviously it's very tough right now in terms of the amount of data uh, being available. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's at the moment what the, the, there isn't been, isn't thought to be an issue, a significant issue. But um, studies are coming out at the moment, so we'll, we will learn more in in the next few weeks and months. Um, we had a question in from um, uh, from Carolyn. Um, uh, what's the correlation between APS and anemia? Um, it, it's it's not a major correlation in that, you know, all patients with APS get anemia, but in some patients, bleeding is, is a problem. Of course, it depends if it's in the lower bowel, uh, a clot there can affect the bowel cause an ulcer and cause bleeding. Um, but it's not, it, it's very rare to have a patient whose main problem is ongoing anemia, as it may sound that this patient has, but um, I, there's no direct, it's not a common thing that we see associated. The other thing in the blood is the platelets. 
and they are part of the syndrome. Um, and in the old days, we used to think this was the main problem, that the antibodies messed up the platelets, which I, I would like to think of the platelets as salmon, you know, swimming in a, a river. They don't touch each other. But if they are affected by the antibody, they get sticky and clot. And some patients run along with a low platelet count. The normal is above 100, and they run along at 80. Uh, and that, that should be taken into account when you're doing your tick list of features. Right, and um, we've had a couple of questions around um, vitamins. So Anna wrote in saying, I've been diagnosed with APS and, and uh, uh, well, there's a, a protein C deficiency. Um, and have been on warfarin ever since. I had a stroke when I was 19 after taking contraceptive pills. Uh, and in 2018, another stroke and DVT again, a clot in a hip and changes in lungs. Um, but I've always had problems with painful heavy periods. Some women feel better after taking um, apaximam. Uh, would it be safe uh, to change to apaximam or, or is it better to stay on warfarin? Um, the answer is we don't know at the moment. I would say yes if, it's, if you're doing well on, on that with your bad clotting problem. Protein C is another of the, of the clotting proteins. It's a different condition. It's bad luck because quite a lot of people have protein C deficiency and if they get used in as well, it's a double, double whammy if you like. Um, if she's okay on warfarin, I would personally don't rock the boat. Um, but it sounds like the patient wants to try a change and I, I have no major objection. The worry is the symptoms she has are, are, are severe, obviously. And, and how, so in terms of how well do you, would you say someone's doing? So she said that, that um, she's been on, on warfarin since 2003, um, but uh, in 2018 she had a stroke and a DVT, a clot in a hip and, and changes in lungs. Like, would you consider that normal? Would you consider that? That's very, very serious. Very, a, a very serious clutter, obviously. She's yeah. in danger of another stroke. Um, and these are the patients where in warfarin you'd be talking about uh, an INR 3.5 to 4. And the patient will tell you with her diary whether, you know, whether she's improving dramatically on 3.8 or 3.9. That would be my first move, definitely. So you're, you, you, one, you'd be looking at that, you'd be very concerned and you would look at their, 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 their medication uh, and, um, and potentially increase the amount of warfarin. And where does yeah. um, apaxaban sit alongside warfarin? There have been a number of patients who have developed a new mini clot coming on across from warfarin. And that's where I was rather worried and negative about the new drugs. Well, perhaps I'm too negative because a lot of people are finding them useful. But this patient, you know, who wants a stroke? And she's getting many strokes and therefore she's not being fully treated yet. It may be that she's on other medicines that I don't know about that are interfering with warfarin. Um, I don't know that. Actually, talking of other me medicines, so Fiona um, or, uh, on Facebook has asked, is it uh, safe to have warfarin in HRT? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it'll affect the warfarin dose, the INR, slightly, but uh, surprisingly, it, it's not that it does alter the level at which you run with your uh, anticoagulant clinic. Uh, but no, there's no contra major contraindication. And we had um, Chris uh, also on Facebook ask uh, about vitamin levels of vitamin D. Is there a recommended level for APS patients? Interestingly, vitamin D has become a major drug in autoimmune diseases. It's, it's been found that the vitamin D deficiency is very common in lupus, very common in other autoimmune diseases. And there have been studies suggested that some patients with Hughes syndrome have a low vitamin D. How that works or interferes with, I, I don't know. Um, but most of our patients are taking the vitamin D spray or tablet daily. So long as whatever you're taking, I think, is on a level basis, then I would not be against it. Yeah, and I think it's common for people, well, obviously we've got an international audience, but in the UK, it is actually co common for people in the UK to have a deficit of vitamin D, in, particularly in uh, the winter uh, and marginally too, which I think in autumn and spring. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's very interesting. Uh, there's a very interesting study on lupus 
uh, and vitamin D because it's supposed to be linked to a shortage of vitamin D. And they looked at the slave generation going from Africa to um, South Carolina. And the black population of South Carolina have a lot of lupus. And then they looked at the people of Sierra Leone, uh, identical genetics, but no lupus. And so why the difference? And the only difference they could find was that vitamin D levels were normal in Sierra Leone and low in, in America. And that's where that bit of data stands at the moment. Wow. Um, interesting. interesting. Um, the, um, we had a couple of questions, which are, um, we've we'll tried to bundle them, bundle them together, uh, which um, uh, were related. So Bex um, messaged in saying, hi, I used to be able to run a lot of marathon distance, but since I got severe DVTs uh, and uh, APS diagnosis, I struggle to run 5K without pain in my legs. Uh, is there any chance I would be able to do fitness again without being in pain? And at the same time, Carol said, I was diagnosed in 2003 after a DVT and given very little information. Uh, I'm sorry, Carol, obviously we're trying to trying to change that, uh, at least for, for, for Graham Hughes syndrome. Uh, and uh, um, I've I not seen any specialists for this since, despite going back and forth to my GP with various symptoms, fatigue, pain, etc. over the years. I've never been told that these symptoms uh, had the potential to be APS related. It wasn't until I met another sufferer who put me in touch with the APS site and everything fell into place. Should I be pushing to see a consultant as my GP doesn't seem to know much about uh, APS? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, DVT may just be the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, the patient who runs, for instance, is there an element of angina? What's, what's stopping that patient going? Uh, yes, DVT can affect the blood supply to your lower limbs, of course, but uh, diagnosis can be made, therefore you should look at the rest of the body's physiology or diagnosis. Um, and that's one of the reasons why my colleagues have set up this charity. We have 75 international doctors on our books, and we're hoping to increase that uh, hugely. There's only 34 countries involved so far. <clears throat> Obviously that's wrong, but talking about the UK, it's something that we really, really are pushing that, you know, we get a list of doctors who are knowledgeable about Hughes syndrome uh, in, a, in a big way. They're often lupus doctors, they're often doctors who run lupus clinics as part of rheumatology. They may be a place to start or a hematologist, um, but, but I'm sorry, I can't be more helpful. I hope we will be able to help you with addresses and details and maps in the future. So I think answering the question was yes, you should, you should definitely push for seeing a consultant, and uh, uh, and um, uh, we as a charity are obviously trying to help you find uh, consultants, and that's something we're working on at the moment. There is already a list on the website uh, um, that you can use, and we're looking to expand that. Um, I think Graham was doing a good job of saying that we recognise it's an international problem, and that we're trying to build that out internationally as well. Uh, and uh, that's one of, one of the many things the charity is trying to do which is definitely a point at which I say we really, donations are very, very important and please donate to the charity. Um, and um, uh, you can donate on the website. Uh, the, um, uh, um, but fatigue and pain though, just to clarify, those are symptoms, those can be symptoms of Graham Hughes syndrome. Uh, yes, the, the answer is yes, it can be and often is. And one thing which I haven't mentioned is memory loss. Now, next to me, migraine, I think, is one of the commonest features, starting when you're, say, 15. Oh, yes, I used to get regular migraine headaches, and uh, I was off college and school for two terms. And then it went away, and then it came back. And that's often the history we get of headaches. But the one above that in frequency, I think, will turn out to be memory loss. Um, so many of my patients, we go through the history, and I ask almost accidentally, if you like, uh, any problems with memory, and it comes pouring out. I'm the joke of the family, I can't remember names. Uh, I always quote one patient when I give a lecture who couldn't remember the exit from the roundabout when she was driving her children to school. And about five, oh, 10 years ago, I suppose, we did work at St. Thomas's where we had a registrar from the neurology department or neuropsychiatric department doing memory tests. And just to give you one example, a young woman aged 20 something, 
her memory was so bad on his testing, it was word finding, she was uh, under 20% of the normal. And she had three weeks heparin trial, which I mentioned earlier on, and her memory test dramatically improved, nearly 90%. Now that's a true figure, anecdotal, in one patient. And I must say our professor of psychiatry said no psychiatric drug comes anywhere near that sort of improvement. So uh, I take memory history very, very carefully as, as an indication perhaps to be a bit more positive about treatment. And as you talk, you talk to memory just then, and we had a, a question in from Gillian, um, uh, who's watching, uh, and she said, uh, is dementia common in APS? Uh, she, her last brain scan report two years ago had a comment that there might be signs, signs of dementia. Oh, don't sit on that. Run to the doctor, get, get seen, because the, the tests are clinical, first of all. Do you have memory problems? Can you be tested or other simple rules? Yes, there are. Um, is there a family history? Same old questions. Knee brain, uh, have any form of clot suspected? Um, and then fancy tests, which at the moment is the fanciest test, of course, is the brain MRI. And that shows one of two things, either nothing wrong, which is common, or little dots like the sky at night. And that is probably little mini clots. And that is an indication, which probably was the case in your brain scan, that there have been blood clotting problems. And if there are still symptoms and signs, then I will be on anticoagulants. Because in the early days, once one of the earliest cases was uh, sadly dementia. Uh, she was played the piano, I think, in a little band that toured a country, it wasn't this country, and um, slowly couldn't get the notes right, bit by bit went in, into full dementia. So here's a woman not diagnosed, not treated, and not, not getting you know, the right treatment for what is a treatable condition. And so is dementia linked to APS or? Well, we, we've linked it. We, we've put this forward uh, as a rare manifestation of untreated APS. And that's what I would say, that one of our main aims is to catch this thing before it causes brain symptoms, which are irreversible. As a main cause of dementia, I don't think we yet know. I don't know of any study of a large dementia clinic, to be honest. Maybe I'm wrong there. Somebody must have done this. Um, but certainly it's, it's a feature of some patients in APS that, if not treated, goes in the direction of dementia. Yeah, that's very, yeah, that's very important and interesting. But uh, so, yeah, your recommend, uh, recommendation to Julian is to, to go and get uh, that investigated very quick, as quickly as she can. Yes, I mean, there's always a risk uh, as a doctor specialising of over stating the case for what they've done and, and I, you know, I recognise that, but in a patient with worrying episodes of dementia, this at young age, I will be chasing her. Yeah, and I think with both conditions, more is being learnt all the time and so it's very important to, um, yeah, to, to, to be investigated and talk to, talk to a specialist. Um, We've got four more questions, uh, and I think we'll we'll stop taking questions from the from the floor now and start to to to, to finish up. Uh, if you do have further questions, do still put them in the comments, and uh, we'll log them for next time. Uh, as, as Graham's very obviously very kind and generous, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again. Um, the um, right, um, uh, Carol, Carolyn has uh, from Facebook has said. Uh, is a, is a repetitive, weak positive blood result over three years still a positive and clinically recognised? Yes, is the answer. I, I would say yes, we see a lot of that borderline positive, intermittently positive, uh, and you should be suspicious. That's just taking the patient's picture rather than just the blood tests. Yeah, and that goes back to the list you were talking to of other symptoms yeah. that help you understand that the, 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 sim, the, the, the disease is present uh, and a list obviously that, that uh, we will be putting up uh, on the uh, on the GHIC website for people to, to review for themselves as well. Um, uh, Ellen uh, has sent in a question, I think it's particularly interesting because we've talked a lot about um, women uh, and uh, this is uh, about boys. So. Um, 
uh, I've been tested um, uh, because my son got APS. The symptoms came back with numbers just above the values. Doctors say there's nothing to worry about, but I, I have some problems with short-term memory and chronic migraines. I've got three children and one miscarriage. Should I push this with my doctor? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, doctors will hate me for this, I know, but um, she's got, you know, the history of miscarriage. She's got migraines, certainly, uh, possibly memory loss needs looking into. And with the, with the family, um, yes is the answer. It's very important. And she may well find this is one of the best things she's ever done. And uh, talking to her, her other children and her, uh, her, um, her sons, like, should she be having asking for her sons to be tested? Um, yes, the, um, in statistics terms, as I mentioned, women outnumber men five to one. This figure five to one keeps coming up. Uh, and so boys seem to escape more the disease than, than women. But with her family, uh, any of the boys getting headaches or any symptom, which is unusual, I suppose the boys are what, mid-teens, then they're probably okay. But if they're getting symptoms test, even if all they need is a baby aspirin every day, it just can help that situation. Now she's asked, um, so her son has been diagnosed and, and I think she's asking for if she should should go and, and be tested. And your answer is very, very clearly yes. For, um, uh, um, and you've talked about looking into family histories. So how genetic is Graham Hughes syndrome? Yes, good question. I was going to mention that. There are genetic studies going on. Uh, there are family histories which have large family trees with this. So there is definitely, like all autoimmune diseases, like thyroid, for instance, there's often a family history. We don't know what the gene is yet or what the genes involved are, but that's under study. Um, every two years, there's an international meeting on Hughes syndrome. And... Um, it's quite a portion of that meeting is discussed on genetics. Um, yeah, which further goes to that if her son has uh, been diagnosed with APS, that, that, that there's a, a, it increases the, the probability that she may, she may have it, particularly showing symptoms. Um, last two questions. Um, Elaine, uh, I've had um, APS for 14 years. Uh, I take warfarin and suffering from bone pain, bone pain uh, uh, on uh, Plaquenil. Um, I thought she asked a really uh, important question, which is what, and we've already touched on dementia. What can she expect as as she gets older? Well, it's like many autoimmune diseases. If you get the diagnosis right and very precisely get the treatment right. Uh, you wouldn't expect the full length of life. Now, there are statistics on that, of course, which is, they, don't, they don't go up to the sort of 80s, but it, it, I've got many patients who have, I've got one school teacher who I know well personally who uh, 40, 40 odd years ago had memory problems and thought she was becoming demented, gave up her job. Um, she's now in her late 80s, I think, um, perfectly well, very sharp. So if you get the treatment right and get the blood flow right to the various organs, you can be so much more positive. And are, are there any particular conditions that, that you see more in older patients um, with APS? Um, it, it, obviously, the differential from, of memory loss in, in older people is, is hard. There are many, many causes. But APS is one of them. And, um, you know, if it's looked for with a a sort of useful test, blood test, the Apple test, then I think you're starting to make inroads into that story. Um, and, uh, just uh, to, uh, Michelle sent in a question under the wire of questions, but it was about um, she has APS and two young sons, uh, and when should she get those tested, get them tested? Because we, we talk with girls that, that around when they're having their first period is a good time to get them tested. Is there a particularly good time to get boys tested, or when would you do um, that? At the moment, we say don't no, don't go down that path yet, unless the boys show symptoms. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's too conservative. But if the boys are doing well and have got full fitness, doing normal sports, no headaches, etc., 
then I would not push at this stage. But as I say, we're gaining more information all the time, and hopefully, we'll be more sensitive tests. So, um, so look at so. Keep, well, so keep an eye on our website, subscribe to our, our list, our mailing list. We'll, we'll let everyone know when that list of, of symptoms goes up that you, you've talked to. But I think your comment to her is like, look, keep an eye out for other symptoms. I think listening to, to, to this video has given an idea of, of what some of those are. And if, if one of the sons um, starts to show those, then, then think about a test. But there's no need to just go and test regardless. Yeah, I mean, a teenager, I mentioned idiopathic te teenage epilepsy. There's quite a story now that some people get their first seizure, uh, and that includes boys, of course, and um, that's one, I mean, a severe symptom, obviously, but that's one to watch for. Before we end, can I come back to the ge genetics, the family study? Uh, absolutely, anyway. you can, absolutely. Well, I, I had a, an elderly man in his 60s, I think, who came to our clinic at St. Thomas's, uh, is accompanied by his daughter, <clears throat> who happened to be one of my patients, who herself suffered from lupus. And this old boy came from the Old Kent Road, which is the poorest place on the, you know, the, the game. And uh, I, he had a DVT and a few other things. And uh, I, I asked, any family, do you have any family history of uh, antihospital? Oh, no, Doc, nothing, nothing, no family history, no. Anyway, his, his daughter poked him in the, in the stomach and said, come on, Dad. And it turned out he was one of 11 siblings. All of them, except, except one, I think, had features. One had migraine, a couple had strokes, one had a heart attack, a couple had DVTs, and um, the daughter had lupus. So th there's, there's a family study for you. Do you know what percentage have the like? Say, if we take take um, women, like what percentage of daughters, if the mother has um, Graham Hughes syndrome, do you, do we know what percentage of daughters are likely to have it? I I, th I think there are some studies out. I, do you know? I don't know the true figure now, but um, I'll find it for you. But it's it's um, it's published. in two hundred and fifty rings a bell, but okay. I don't. On that until, uh, I get but the, the main, but the main point being, like it's a, it's a, it's a small fraction of, uh, um, it, it's not, it's not guaranteed. It's a, it's a, yeah, okay. Um, and do you think that the gender split is, could that be due to the increased diagnosis in women due to issues around um, uh, conception and, and pregnancy, or so do you, or, or do you think it? It is it's not evenly split between genders, or do you think it could be? Um, we used to think originally that it was the first thing you mentioned, which is that they were picked up because they'd seen the doctor for pregnancy. Uh, we now know that that's not quite the, the truth, that um, women outnumber men about five to one. And that's interesting because all the autoimmune diseases are commoner in women. And it's believed now that female hormones um, increase the autoimmune response in general. Uh, lupus, for instance, nine to one women to men. So, you know, a, a huge difference in sex ratio. And all the diseases I mentioned, like thyroid, rheumatoid, MS, and so on, commoner in women. And I think that applies to this, which is an autoimmune disease. If the immune system has gone wrong, it's producing antibodies, which are bad guys, not not good on the whole and um, it's a disease that we can diagnose and we can treat which is marvelous. Um, our, last, uh, our last question, um, uh, Carolyn uh, said uh, APS is still massively unheard of across primary care and secondary care specialists uh, therefore how can we drive awareness and learning and ensure APS is part of the curriculum in doctors foundation and core medical training? Well, I think doing more of what you're doing here now, uh, you know, making videos, uh, I've written lots of booklets and books for patients, but the modern thing is, of course, the internet. And um, I, I think with teams like Henry's here, that we will get through in the UK. I, I've lectured all over the world on this, and it's surprising how widespread the keenness and the interest is. Uh, full houses always amongst doctors. So I think that the word is getting out there. Um, so some countries, like Italy, France, Spain, where 
knowledge is, is, is jumping ahead. The very good teams working on this. Um, and so internationally, it's becoming more recognized. Certainly in the Journal of Lupus, which I'm involved with, um, more papers coming through. And is it a part of core training for a, for a doctor, do you know? I'm prejudiced because I think, I think it is. I think it's important. No, but, it, but do you know if it is? Like, obviously, we all agree it should be. <laughs> um, but do you know if there, it is a part? It's a part, it should be a part of core training because it touches on all, all branches of medicine. I think one of the issues, obviously, is, is the the weight that it's given, and uh, and and then that doctor um, remembering it at, at an important time in the future, um, yeah. uh, and, and uh, raising the profile of the disease disease in the medical yeah. community and and in the patient community is, uh, uh, and the white the, the wider population is obviously very important. And the reason I had this question is last is because it's a lot of what the charity is trying to do. And uh, we need money to do that, so please donate. <laughs> and, um, that was Thank a, you. That was why, why that was at the end. Um, but it's actually a genuine thing that we raising awareness, doing this kind of thing, increasing the profile of the of um, uh, the, the disease and the charity is a core part of our work, and and very very important. And more awareness actually means more diagnosis and more more lives saved. It it, it is implicitly important. Uh, we're then working to provide quality information so people can uh, um, understand the disease well, uh, and we're constantly building that out, as you've seen on the on the the, the website, which we renewed uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, and uh, uh, and ongoing looking to fund research. Uh, and as you can as you've heard, Graham is instrumental in the uh, in the research area and runs the uh, the journal for for lupus uh, and. Which is collating and publishing a lot of um, uh, a lot of the papers on Graham Hughes syndrome, so very important, uh, and is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, he remains one of the uh, the centres and leading experts on the on the disease because he's constantly um, uh, keeping up to breast and is being a part of moving that knowledge forward. Um, that's it. That's all our questions, Graham. Um, You've been fantastic as, as ever. I know it's hugely valued. I've, we've seen all the questions coming in uh, and uh, we've, we have we obviously know from the comments, and I'm sure we'll see some later, but people uh, from all over the world, uh, um, from South Africa, from Spain uh, and other places uh, uh, tuning in uh, to watch. I know from comments previously that people have scheduled to take days off work to, to be watching this. Uh, and so it is, it's hugely valued and uh, and so thank you on behalf of everyone and and obviously he's the Graham Hughes International Charity so you're <laughs> both the founder and remain the, the center of uh, of the charity um so I think that just the, yeah so thank you very much do you have any final words you want to say to people is there any, anything you particularly want to cover well thank you to Henry and his team and thank you to the colleagues who've started this charity um I, I don't understand clotting and I don't understand the internet, but you're doing it for me. I hope I understand clotting more <laughs> when I speak to you. But many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very, very much um, indeed uh, for, for doing this. And I look forward to doing it again. And uh, um, for everyone watching, uh, Graham has very kindly promised to, do, to, to keep doing these. And it's, I think, hugely important, hugely valued. Uh, we'll also be having um, some of you. So I'll say goodbye to Graham and thank you very much. Uh, and uh, obviously my final thing I have to do is, is say, uh, um, after having thanked him, is to say, look, um, GHIC look, is trying to do something very important. We're trying to really change what it, what it means to have Graham Hughes syndrome and uh, um, make it um, uh, change the impact of uh, of when you're diagnosed, provide you with information, provide you with support, uh, and then fund research to change those outcomes and uh, and look into uh, more about the disease. And obviously, our our main thing is to try and find a cure. Uh, but uh, uh, everyone is working very hard. Um, we can't do anything without donations, so please do consider donating. Uh, you can donate on our website. Uh, links are on uh, the uh, the social media you're watching. Um, Thank you for, for watching. If you've got any further questions, do post them in the comments. We will store them and uh, uh, post them next time. Otherwise, look out for our next announcement. Uh, we will also be bringing in other people who are part of the um, trustee board and specialists uh, in Graham Hughes syndrome 
uh, to compliment uh, the, the great man himself and to provide uh, uh, other viewpoints and, and other answers. And so we look forward to doing that. Please subscribe to the mailing list and, and follow us on social media to be notified of that. Um, that's it. So goodbye again to, 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 to Graham, who is very kindly hanging out. But goodbye and thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we look forward, um, everyone, hopefully, for, to joining us again. Um, thank you for joining us and, and goodbye. Thank you.